gotta be real conversational. And uh, I also want to remind folks that we do have a microphone. And if you have any questions for Harrison, uh, we'd be glad to ask them because this is more about you than about me. But I got plenty. Plus, we'll just go wherever. Oh, uh, okay. But uh, talking about center of attention, um, you once said that if you ever became famous for being a matte painter, it'll mean I'm a failure. Do you still feel that way now that you're famous for being a matte painter? Whoa. <laughs> Couldn't we start it out with an easier one? No, I got it. It's going to get North easier. North Dakota. Uh, Bismarck, by the way. Bismarck. Uh, Pierre, as I know. Pierre. No, it's Bismarck and Pierre, South Dakota. South Dakota. Okay, any other jokes? See, we got, past the, we got past the education you cycle. Offer, um, well, I mean, I look, understand. Long I, when, I, when I started painting matte paintings, and um, my father before me, and in fact, his stepfather painted matte paintings, and had been around for a long time, they were very well known. You know, when you went to see a movie, you saw the stars, and that's about as much as anybody wanted to know. Uh, directors, some were, became a little bit more known by the public, and same with producers, but that wasn't, that wasn't the thing. And um, there, were, there, were, there was some thought at one point, well, you don't want to talk about matte paintings or, or special effects, and we call them visual effects, because that will destroy the illusion. Um, if you ask a magician how to do that, he or she generally will say, I don't reveal those things because I don't want to spoil the illusion. That's the entertainment. Um, but as things change, and it's certainly changed over a few decades now, that became a fascination by many people. Uh, Gee, I know that. It, Star Wars. You know they didn't go into outer space to shoot it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Darn. The small children in the room. Jeez. Uh, I can't see them. But. And I, I didn't, I didn't notice um, when I, when I was offered the job. I, I took the job because it was directed by the man who directed American Graffiti, which was one of my, and still is, one of my all-time favorite films. Um, so it was, and it's rare that directors have hits. Um, some never have hits, and they're, they're good directors. Some not so good directors have hits, but that, that's time for another discussion. So, I learned uh, from my mentor, Alan Maley, wonderful map painter, and that you don't want to be noticed. It's the same thing with editors. If you notice the editing in a film, especially years ago, then it wasn't working. Because film is a very special way of presenting a story. It's visual. We want to immerse ourselves, we want to get into that theater and be transported. And it's still that way, but now there's this interest, especially by other filmmakers, people who are starting to make films, to want to understand how that works. And you will find, I found this very early, that they're happy to tell you. People like to brag about good effects, about good puppetry. They like to say, well, this and this and this. And it doesn't spoil the illusion. It makes it even more important. Because you know, again, don't want to burst your bubble, Yoda's not a real person. <laughs> no, he was here this morning. I, I was at that You're thing. right, he brought it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yoda. He, looked, he gave me side eye the entire time. So, so that's that's why I said that long ago that quote, and um, I, I was I was serious. I, I didn't want people to notice my work, um, and I always said at the same time I made that quote. I said if, if there's if there's some kid in Illinois who goes, hmm, 
nice painting. You failed. Uh, I don't know if that kid is still alive. <laughs> but, and it was the same with my, with my family. Some of my family lives in Pennsylvania. And I was very glad when they saw a film that I had worked on and maybe seen my credit. They had no clue what I had done. And if you try to explain how a composite works, people's eyes still glaze over. Okay, well, first you shoot this. Well, hold on, I got a question. Okay, I was going to ask how a composite works. There's no simple answer. Yes, sir. You do a painting, you have live action, you put it together. There. Now we, now we can go. Oh. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's my much, pleasure. It's much more than that because, uh, I mean, I'm a, I can think of some famous mad paintings in movies. Uh, mm -hmm. Jabba's Palace is mm -hmm. one that springs to mind. Um, in Temple of Doom, when they have the palace, um, yeah. uh, the, the, the Raja's palace. Um, you did one of uh, Slave One, uh, Boba yeah. Fett's ship. Yeah. Um, at the time, I had no idea how those, and it took me a long time to figure out how those things work because painting on glass doesn't, it makes sense when you describe it, but it, it seems like it's a medium that'd be very difficult to, to figure out. Can you kind of break down? I know it's a... Well, I, I, painting on glass isn't, that's not the skill. Well, see, I'm, I'm talented, so I don't know. So that sounds like it's... Well, it, everybody's good at something. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll discuss that later in therapy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do not go personal. <laughs> um, Look, uh, and I, I still haven't found the way to explain simply a composite, a matte painting, how it gets put together, because it's really complicated and it's really hard. Uh, a lot of people think uh, that when you become an established artist, a uh, matte painter or a fine artist, gallery artist, that it just kind of flows. You're, you're talented, you, you know, you probably sit there and read the newspaper while you're just, you know, putting it together. It's incredibly hard because you never, you never do the same shot twice. You only do it one time. And that alone means that you can never be, you know, overconfident and that, Occasionally, throughout my career, there would be times that the painting would fight back. It would, it, the shot would, it, you'd go to dailies and you'd think, please work, especially before digital, because then you only had one shot at it, and if you, if you screwed up during the shot, you had to go back to the beginning and reshoot all the elements, and sometimes there are 25, 30 elements. So it's kind of like doing your college uh, term paper uh, with a typewriter, without digital, without being able to just correct the one thing. And I re remember, this is, I'm aging myself, doing term papers in college where you'd have to type them clean and you'd get down to the last word and you'd almost be shaking because, you know, you didn't want to go here when it should be H-E-R Whiteout hadn't been invented. I mean, I'm really aging myself, and many professors didn't allow that. And it was the same with film, and it still is, but it's easier to make the modifications, the small ones. The big ones, not so easy. And um, part of the challenge, uh, actually, for, for us on um, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back was that George was very secretive, and you never, you never saw the, the script. So you had no idea what you were painting. And uh, on, on Star Wars, the, uh, they had built half of the Millennium Falcon on, on the stage and the map painting was gonna be the other half. Well, I worked, I worked at night I, at, uh, at Island and Van Nuys because I was working in, in the daytime on what I thought would be a big hit, Pete's Dragon. Anyway, shows what I know. Uh, hey, wait a minute, Pete's Dragon was Yeah, good. it was pretty good. And uh, they even remade it. It was so good. Well, uh, I didn't say the good remake was good. I'm just saying they, it was good I enough to it. Mm. 
<laughs> I mean, it, it has they Redford didn't work on that. I don't know. It has Rob Redford in it, but they, they, they didn't really do a lot of matte painting. But we'll see. It would have been better with matte painting. Okay. I, but I can do this. <laughs> no, I absolutely would um, <laughs> So you're working for Peach, so Peach Dragon? So working on Peach Dragon, and I, I got a call. Would you be interested? I Okay. I'll back up one more place. I was working at Disney in, in the math department. Uh, I had, uh, Alan Maley had retired uh, after three and a half, four years or so. And I said, well, who's going to take your place? And he looked at me and he said, you are. And I, I kind of freaked out. Uh, once I, I, I got OK with that, uh, Disney, who only did uh, matte paintings for Disney films, um, got a call uh, from uh, the producers who were making Man Who Felt Earth with David Bowie, and they asked if uh, if they if they could borrow uh, me to do some effects for that. So um, they thought I wouldn't want to do it, but it was a great opportunity. I mean, David Bowie, Man Who Felt Earth. I had no idea. I didn't understand the script. I was shooting the movie, and I still didn't understand this, the movie. The movie came out, I went to see it, I still didn't understand it. <laughs> it was explained to you, and you still didn't understand uh, it? It was explained to me. I would say, for example, David Bowie's walking away from the spaceship, and then the dialogue is, we're leaving, we're going to another planet. I go, well, I would look at Nick Rogue, I go, why are they walking away? Should they be walking to the spaceship? And I think he said something like, oh, it's much more visual. You'll see their faces if they're walking away. No, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> That's a, okay, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> no, actually we are, because one of the things that, uh, this is a perfect example of some directors knowing how to use mad paintings and some directors don't. And yeah. I think that George Lucas, uh, Jump in. And so can you tell me the difference between a, a director who knows what they're doing and knows how to, knows the quality of a matte painting, the importance of it versus, uh, you know, David Well, Bowie. because George, number one, is a great storyteller, and we all know that. Um, and he's, he's an excellent writer, which obviously follows. He loves editing, excellent editor, and so he has enough knowledge, he had enough knowledge and enthusiasm to know all the aspects of filmmaking, especially post-production, which he loved. He, he was not a big fan of production. There's a, there's a lot of sitting around and, and hurry up and waiting. So it, it kind of came as second nature to him, and he was able to communicate what he wanted, and that was very helpful. Uh, but the first film, as I say, he was very secretive. So when I came to paint the second half of the Millennium Falcon, at the time it was called The Pirate Ship, and of course the first time I heard that, I thought, oh, I thought this was a space fantasy, and now we're doing a pirate movie, but anyway. Um, so they built the left side of, of, the, of the Falcon, and which had the cockpit. So I thought, oh, I guess it's symmetrical. So I painted the right side, and I put a cockpit in there. I thought, well, that's where the co-pilot would go. Which makes no sense anyway. <laughs> Never, I think the lesson was, don't try to outthink the filmmaker. <laughs> well, I mean, it makes perfect sense because when they're, there's that shooting scene where Han is shooting, you know, don't get cocky kid, and then all the way to the other end is another exact duplicate of the him shooting it. So it's a perfectly understandable, yeah. reasonable. Yeah. But so you, like, when you make these map things, how much access do you have? Because you said he does, he's very secretive of the script, but you still have to not only paint something that is fantastical, but realistic. So how do you do that when they're giving you piecemeal? <laughs> well, thank heavens for Ralph McQuarrie, probably one of the greatest artists and nicest gentleman that I've ever met. That that was the that was the saving grace because I had access to or looking at Ralph's basic production illustrations. Everything was there. 
Now there were some, you know, modifications when the when the uh, the, the miniatures were built and little things like that. But that 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 was the grounding that I had, and um, I just took my cue off of that. And, and also occasionally, as I say, George would would uh, he rarely laughed, but it, he did laugh when he saw the two cockpits. I was I was crushed. I thought, oh God, he hates the shot. I didn't hate the shot. Well, you're not only a matte painter, you, you are a very effective and nominated miniature uh, creator. Visual effects. Yeah, but you did some miniature effects on uh, Black Hole, yeah. which uh, I remember as a kid because I used to go to Disneyland, or Disney World, sorry, and they had a Black Hole in the Epcot Center that we had to run against the green screen, against the big thing. <laughs> really? And yeah, and me and my brother would run, and they would show it to you on the screen. You didn't see what was going on. It was the magic of movies. It's the magic. Of so uh, I can tell because you come from a family of painters. Did, did you move into miniatures because just to rebel? Just to try to make your own way, or no? I love shooting miniatures. It was a, it was just kind of one of those. My father did that. Now there were very strict rules in Hollywood at the time, uh, union rules that you could only do one thing. And uh, my father didn't go by those rules. He was a rule breaker. He did, he wasn't going to let somebody else paint the miniature. Uh, we at one point in Black Hole. There's a big backing, star backing, and uh, so the scenic artist did a wonderful job on it, and uh, my dad was not pleased. He wanted to do a few extra things, including add stars to it, which was, of course, part of the logic. And um, so all the stars were very nicely put in, but they were all kind of equidistant from one another. So, he went and he started redoing the stars, and I, I, you know, saw the big sound stage, and I knew we were going to get that. Oh, who's got, who are these people? Come on, these, yeah, everybody, get up. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when this happens. You, this is again, you're very popular. Yeah, you're okay. the, you're a famous bat, 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 bat. George, let me call you back. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, don't worry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll handle it. Trust me. Yeah. In, in, enjoy the beach. Okay. <laughs> he, he doesn't call me. No, he, he actually flies to your house, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's that rich now. Four billion. What is it? A couple billion dollars he gave for Star Wars to Disney. So he's got. He's okay. He's doing well. Right. well okay. Well, let, let's get a little credit here. He got five billion dollars. He gave away the damn franchise, um, and he uh, he kept a billion, and he gave four billion to an uh, education yeah. foundation. Oh, I'm not saying he he I has done good with it. He's just, no, he's a good he's guy. Okay. He's okay. He's, he's a good guy. Yeah. I would have kept all five billion. <laughs> <laughs> I could buy a better phone. Um, <laughs> you, but, could, you could you could turn the ringer off. On Good yeah, I don't know. But what's the small buttons? I mean, why do we have the tiny stuff? Look, I can barely. Who was it? Uh, oh, yeah. I don't want to talk. About okay. <laughs> See, it's very secretive. These bad painters don't want to know. You don't want. You don't know who exists. <laughs> Everything's behind a shroud of mystery for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Visual effects artists. Uh, so you did the black hole, which you were nominated with your with your father. Yes. Yeah. It, that was that was a lot of fun. And, and what is it about the miniatures versus painting? Because, I mean, you're painting miniatures, so that's one thing. So you're still doing painting. But what is it about miniatures? And, and to me, I don't even know how you guys even find the things to make the miniatures with. Sometimes you, <laughs> I mean, because every once in a while you'll see, oh, that's a, I think that's a spark plug. And then, oh, is that a potato or a shoe? You know, the asteroid field of the Empire. So it's like, how yeah. do you, is that part of the fun? It's like I think that's, that's part of the fun. That's, uh, you do whatever, you know, gets you through the shot. And, um, it, the only problem becomes when uh, you're doing a show in 3D. I supervised uh, Captain EO, and doing effects in 3D is really hard because you have mixed scales, but the 3D will give it away, so you've got to pull out some more tricks. 
So what kind of things, what kind of tricks? And so the, now it's time to let the magician explain you everything. You think I can remember that far back? Just, just, any, just in general, how would you do a, how some of these tricks you're talking about? Well, you don't uh, to get specific, you can give me more of a general. We would, oh, some of the, uh, this was really tough for effects sound managers. Those are the people that do the, you know, squiggly electricity or the laser beams or whatever it is. Now they had to animate left eye and right eye. And I, I don't know how they did it. I, you know, I, I wanted to do uh, some live action elements. So I would go, I take two cameras, shoot them up at the ceiling and then drop, you know, rice or something down. And they would theoretically uh, trace that rotoscope and, and you would have 3D. Uh, they didn't like that idea. And <laughs> I would often get in a little bit of trouble with the, with the effects animators because they'd say, why did you do it that way? Well, I thought it'd be easier for you. You, you know, Harrison, don't cool help. your jets. We, we got this. Yeah, don't help. <laughs> don't help. <laughs> yeah. One of the other things that, is, that you've done that amazes me is Tron. So you don't know that you were in charge of the visual effects on Tron? Is that the right? Yes. Yes, I want to make sure that I put you in the proper hierarchy. Uh, um, I'm in the hierarchy. So uh, obviously... How do, do we do that? Yeah, uh, obviously the, the place is not in the computer is easy because that's actual. But then once you get into, and this is 1982, 81? Yeah, 82. Uh, this is all groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, um, and you're probably inventing a lot of it, or maybe yeah, we had to. Fly. We didn't. Uh, we had, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We created a whole new wheel. Okay. It was it uh, that w was very pleasurable, but there were a lot of sleepless nights because there were the there were the concepts, the the script, and then incredible drawings by Sid Mead and Mobius and Peter Lloyd, and who set the tone and. Uh, I think it took us probably a whole week to try to figure out how to get 45 minutes of, you know, elect electronic glow and stuff. To these days, this is a little bit easier, but we had to go through, okay, you know, we're gonna make codeless, what are codeless, what size are they, high con, all that technical junk um, to come up with the, the look of the film and try not to spend more than the extra money we kept asking for. <laughs> well, and I think that's the biggest problem of most visual effects is that there's this thing called a budget. Well, yeah, because uh, we didn't know what the budget would be, so it was a single line item on the budget sheet. It was uh, effects, and they asked me how much it would cost. I said, uh, how much is the budget on the film? And I said, oh, put in two million. It's going to cost. So eventually, now two million was a reasonable amount back then. But eventually, uh, Ron Miller, who was the executive producer and the head of Disney Studios, um, the the producer uh, on the show, and I would have to go in at least once every two or three weeks at the end and ask for more money. And so we had nothing to show him. All we had were, were thin strips of. 35 millimeter film with different colors on it. And so you're not so even showing the movie, you're just showing him so strips of film. Yeah. So, so he's so holding them up going. No, I, I, was, I was a little smarter than Good. that. Good, that's, so, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so occasionally he would say, what the hell are you guys doing down there? You know, what, what the, Ron, we're, we'll come by your office and we'll have stuff to show you. So Donald Kushner and I are going, what are we gonna show him? I said, I, we'll show them a wedge, we'll show them this, this much with different colors on it. And um, I, he said, well, he, he doesn't, he's not gonna hold it up to the, the light. And I said, let's not worry. I'll take a portable light box about this side and plug it in and a, and a loop, which is a magnifier that you put down on the light box. And so we went down to his office and he was a little grumpy. Uh, <laughs> Oh, he says, start when you ask me for money. Yeah, well, have you ever asked anybody for money who was happy? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Especially after I asked. Especially if you're not going to get it back. 
But anyway, um, so we went down to his office and he was, he was a great guy. However, he had also uh, played uh, tight end for the Rams. So he was an imposing figure. <laughs> Luckily, he had married Walt Disney's daughter. Uh, so anyway, that's a whole other seminar. Uh, which will be right after this yeah, one, so we can just stick around. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, anyway, so we go down there and, and he says, what do you want? And so, okay, we want to show you something and then we want to update you a little bit. So I would go over and I'd try to find a plug to plug in the, the, the light box and then we'd lay it out and, and say, Ron, take a look at this. And so he put the magnifier up here and he said, I can't see anything. I take it from him and go, oh, it's like this. You gotta go. You don't want to insult the man. Um, and we did that about three, four times. And each time, by the fourth time, he knew what was coming. He figured, he, out the loop. Yeah, okay. he figured out the loop. Uh, we, we didn't have the nerve to ask for the extra eight million that we knew it was gonna cost. And so we figured if we just piss him off a little bit at a time, it'd be better. Ask it wasn't. Minutes. Four times <laughs> instead of eight. By the fourth time, it was, you know, oh, okay, get out of my office. Luckily we had a release date, so we had to make that eventually it stopped. So for someone who's had the opportunity, because now they're pretty much the same company, you worked for Lucasfilm <laughs> and Disney separately. Uh, yes, was, isn't that the irony? Yeah, now they're one place. Well, they own everything. Yeah. They own California, they own <laughs> parts yeah. oh, of on, Asia. I'm on the payroll. This is yeah. a, But my question is, what was the fundamental difference working for each company? Well, uh, working at ILM on Star Wars was, uh, you know, tape and, and bailing wire. It was a, it built in a where, empty warehouse in Van Nuys. At Disney, all the, the optical printers and everything was had been in place for years, and there was a certain protocol. And so I would go from the daytime at Disney, I'd go home, have dinner, go over to ILM in a different part of town, and they were still building equipment and when I'm trying to paint and it was it was totally opposite ends of the spectrum and I had my I certainly had my doubts I thought these guys will never get this worked out but they did it's kind of like going the, the, it's so professional in Walt Disney yeah. to go to ILM which is yeah. really it's like a startup it's like it I was work, a startup yeah I'm working for you know it's not the government, and now I'm gonna go work for and I think there were about. 40 people who ended up working on the movie and some outside vendors uh, and now ILM, everybody knows what ILM is. And so you progressed up through the Disney system. You ended up being the yeah. head of their visual effects department. Yeah. Um, what was the what was the most fun that you had on a particular <laughs> one? Is there is there a couple things that you remember that were just a they were either extremely hard or uh, that you didn't get quite right, or there was one that was extremely hard that was very satisfying when you got it figured out. Well, yeah, kind of both things because the pressure was so intense. Uh, I couldn't do it now at my age at all, but I was young, ambitious. She's only 47. Yeah, it's amazing. I don't look a day over 80. This is what happens when you work in big sweats. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep pooping the mic. Uh, I didn't say poop in the mic. Poop in the mic. Wow, that's all right. Okay, we're well, doing great. I don't think anybody's complained. I haven't seen anybody walk out yet. Oh, I saw one. Yeah, but that was, that was my fault. I think it was more me than you. Okay, well, let's not argue about that. Okay. It's your fault. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then we're in agreement. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember what I asked. <laughs> no, what was the, basically I'm trying to figure out what was your Ahab, what was your white whale for you that you, or something that you was really difficult that you succeeded in it, the most satisfying. So what was the most difficult and in, most satisfying? In Star Wars? And just in general, because you've had such Tron, a Tron, Tron was really tough. As I say, we had to come up with a whole methodology that was, uh, ended up being groundbreaking. And interestingly enough, was used only that one time, because then as time went on, eventually digital took over and so, There'll never be another Tron done that way. That's a lost art. That's a that's a you know kind of a, 
a nice little one side of light. Yeah, because it was right at that cusp and everything had to go. At one point, I was doing seminars similar to this, and each frame of every shot, which was about a hundred and sixty thousand frames, <coughs> had twenty elements uh, blown up onto animation cell. And uh, I remember giving a, a, a talk somewhere, and I bought just one frame worth of elements. And I said, and I won't, I'll, I'll spare it now, because I, I, I probably wouldn't remember it all. I said, first you start out with a piece of 65 millimeter film, then you do this, and then you do this, and then you take this continuous tone which is developed in blah, 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 and you put it against another one, and that gives you the mat, and then you have to do a face reveal for this, that, and another thing. And people were just sitting there in the audience going, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> that's what I just thought. Just yeah, now. well, that's what I, I thought now, because I... <laughs> no, but I understand, because it's, for a lot of the times, I don't think you understand that each element, as you're saying, is actually would be a layer of, yeah. of either, well, in this case, it would be film, and then maybe the glass for uh, the matte painting, and yeah, you know, you're well, taking so, photograph on top of photograph. So photograph. then you had the backgrounds to worry about, which were done completely separately, and then you had to composite them on animation stamps. And the depth of field must be driving you crazy if they want to switch. Oh, everything in control is crazy. So, so then you move into digital, and you've, you've worked on some digital uh, as far as computer graphics and things like that. Before. Yeah. And how has that changed? I mean, obviously it's a monumental change, but how has it changed the workflow, the ease? The, 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 obviously it's cheaper too, but. How did you see the difference? It's not cheaper. Everybody thinks it. Everybody tells the studios this is cheaper. Too far. Uh, but somehow, <laughs> it's not. Well, it's I, never cheaper. Well, I say that because I go on YouTube and see 22-year-old yes. kids do amazing special effects yes. uh, for their things. So it's got to be somewhat cheaper or more accessible. Well, we don't employ those kids. They're oh. smart. Well, your dreams have been crushed. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know? Any, any young kids here want to get into the business? <laughs> No, it, it, it's, what was the question? <laughs> Give me another question. I will. So now we've moved on, because we were first, you were doing fine art painting. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's something that you truly enjoy and love to do, because it's not something that, you know, you have to go to the office and someone tells you, I need a, I need a lily garden, quick now, <laughs> right? This is stuff that you enjoy, this well, is what you prefer to do. I, I've been retired now for, a number of years and 47 that's amazing it is amazing isn't it? you know i retired at uh i was 18. uh <laughs> do the math <clears throat> anyway um digital really did change everything for the first time i i could get sleep at night because when there's something wrong with the shot in digital you just have to change that one thing before an analog, if there was something wrong with the shot, you had to go back and recomposite with all the different elements. You'd have this 20 hours of compositing, and then you had to wait till it came back from the lab to see it. Now, in fact, when we started to get into digital, so the compositors would be sitting in front of a computer screen, and you know they'd see me come in and they go, you know, kind of. What was it like in the old days? <laughs> I said, well, it was all black and white, and then color came along, and I'd smack them on the back of the head. And, and sir, I was going to ask you, <laughs> hopefully you smacked them in the Yeah, no. Uh, so, you know, if I wanted to be very dramatic about it, I'd turn off the monitor, and I'd say, that's what it was like. Well, how do I know what I'm doing? You didn't. You had no idea if you'd done it right or you did it wrong until 12 hours later the next day. And so there were, I became a convert uh, to uh, the religion and, because I was always say, you know, doing this, uh, make this shot work, oh please, please. And now you can just go back step. Now you can just go back. And I'm not minimizing the, the what I see in movies these days uh, as we, probably know every every frame has some post-production thing happening to it and it's amazing it's just amazing 
I don't even try to figure it out. Well, so we have a few, any, any questions? Again, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, and I, like I said, I do want to talk about your fine art painting because it, it seems oh. like something you really enjoy. What, do you, what is your focus? Uh, what, what do you like to paint? I don't, uh, well, I don't paint as much as I used to. I used to paint uh, uh, with Disney characters in them, which would be made into chiclets, and I could sell those. And now I, I also painted fine art paintings. Uh, I was very much influenced uh, by the Fauves, uh, which are very colorful, part of the French Impressionist movement. And that came along at the same time that Dick Tracy came along. So it was a perfect storm in that the matte paintings, uh, again, about oh, 80, 80 matte paintings on Dick Tracy, are very colorful, very super saturated. And that was the influence of the Fauves and doing that. So then I began to do gallery art with very, uh, very intense colors. And, and so you stopped doing that? Or you just I don't do as much as I used to. And, well, we need to get you back doing that. Because uh, I've seen some of your work. It's very good. Oh, well, thank you. That's why I brought it up, because I can tell that you actually enjoy that. Not that you didn't enjoy other stuff, but this is stuff that there's, there's no deadline. There's no uh, etiquette. There's yeah, no which, which is a, kind of a bad thing. If you have a deadline, then you get to it. If you don't have a deadline, I'm, I'm terrible at self-imposed deadlines, because I'm just going, eh, it's not working, I'll, I'll come back in the morning. Because there's no punishment. Yeah. If I say I'm not going to do it till tomorrow, then, yeah. then, you know, and you don't do it till Thursday, who, who's going to yell at you? You? <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, all right. Yeah. So, um, so what out there now, as far as movies, have impressed you? I mean, now that you see, you've been working in visual effects for so long, um, and now that they, is there anything out there that's jumped out at you and you say, wow, they, they really did something different? They've really done something that's unique or I really like? Well, uh, considering that you know I had a 40-year <coughs> career, uh, there's a lot that's impressed me. Um, and this, this may sound a lot, but one of the uh, breakthrough movies for me what has no effects in it is Run, Lola, Run. Oh, Run, Lola, Run's fantastic. If you've never seen Run, Lola, Run, that is a German, yeah. German or Danish? I think it's German. It's a, I it, can't remember. And it's, and it's, a, it's like, a, like a Rashomon kind of situation where they show this girl. Yeah, she times. just runs throughout the movie. Sounds, sounds Somebody, like it would be interesting. But the cutting, the editorial, the, and uh, breaking the waves, and then that's Danish. Uh, so these are considered art films. And, um, you know, when I was very young, I growing up in a film family, I, I was fascinated about films. My father's stepfather, my grandfather, if you will, worked in the British film industry and worked on things to come and a lot of classic and did mad paintings that I would go to see these films and I had no idea what was there. And they were so good. So it, it's been a great ride. I've seen the you know, all sides of it. And today, favorite films, I have so many of them due to the effects, but also there's there's a lot of good film making out there. It, it just, it, the, the art matures and people learn. Some learn better than others, some never learn. It's kind of like your kids, you'll never learn, uh, but eventually they do. Well, I think we've learned a lot today, and we really appreciate your time. So, uh, you're going to be here uh, today and tomorrow, or just today? Just today. Just today. He's right here, right across the hall, I believe, right where the. You, I, you share a room with uh, Billy B, don't you? I thought it was my room. It I is. Him to I, go said, go I said. Find his own I said you share your room with Billy B. <laughs> so, once again, uh, Harrison Ellenshaw, please give him a big round. Thank you for being here. <laughs>